Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tourette Association of America's virtual conference. My name is Natalie Blaine, and I am the Education Project Manager at the Tourette Association of America. Thank you so much for joining today's session on translating evidence-based interventions into clinical practice. We want to thank our platinum sponsors, the Warner Fund and Pharma, as well as all our donors and supporters for making this free conference possible. To support educational programming like this, you may visit Tourette.org slash donate to make a contribution today. During the session, we would be very happy to hear from you and include your voice in the conversation. You may ask questions or share comments using the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player at any time. We will collect your questions and address them during the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce our pres presenters, Dr. Erica Greenberg and Dr. Joseph McGuire. Dr. Erica Greenberg is a child adolescent psychiatrist at Massachusetts General Hospital and an instructor in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Greenberg is the director of the Pediatric Psychiatry, OCD and Tick Disorders Program at MGH and a co-director of the Tourette Association of America, MGH Center of Excellence. Her interest includes Tourette syndrome, OCD, Tourette OCD, ADHD, and body-focused repetitive behavior disorders. She is the primary investigator on a study evaluating a behavioral treatment for those with tic disorders and ADHD, and she has authored several peer-reviewed manuscripts on Tourette syndrome, OCD, and related disorders. Dr. Greenberg graduated from Will Cornell Medical College with Alpha Omega Alpha Honors and completed her general psychiatry residency at Harvard Longwood and her child adolescent fellowship training at Massachusetts General Hospital, McLean, where she served as chief residence in both programs. Dr. McGuire is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He has over 10 years of research and or clinical experience in the assessment and treatment of Tourette's disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anxiety disorders, and related conditions. Dr. McGuire has received numerous national and international awards. He has co-edited three books with El Salvia, published over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, and has given dozens of conference presentations. Dr. McGuire has great, gratefully received research support from the National Institute of Mental Health, Tourette Association of America, and the American Academy of Neurology. So I would like to welcome Drs. Greenberg and Drs. McGuire to start their presentation. That, that, is, that is quite the introduction. Um, so first and all, uh, thank you guys so much. Um, so, so Dr. Greenberg and myself uh, would love to talk to you about translating evidence-based interventions into clinical practice. And where this kind of came out of was what we've seen in our kind of practice is, you know, patients and families come on in and, and you see, you know, CBIT last eight sessions, or here's the kind of guidelines. How do we kind of bring those from the kind of, you know, books that we read, the, the research conferences that we give into clinical practice? How do we adapt them so that they work? Uh, and that's really the kind of rationale behind what we're doing. Uh, so we're going to, if I don't mess up my screen share here, uh, the game plan for today is focusing on evidence-based interventions and giving everybody a brief overview of what they are and what they aren't. Talking about the differences between research and clinical practice, so what's done in a clinical trial versus what goes on in, in kind of everyday practice. Talking about practical modifications to behavior therapy or in what behavior therapy is and what modifications kind of go on into it. We'll talk about kind of modifications to, to medication therapy or pharmacotherapy. And then really the kind of goal of this is to have more of an interactive question and answer period where we can share with you a little bit about our experiences and maybe think through some of the challenges that, that we're all going through together. So starting us off, just kind of talking a little bit about what are the evidence-based treatments uh, for Tourette syndrome. And when I talk about Tourette syndrome, I kind of lump everything in terms of, um, you know, persistent slash chronic motor tic disorder, uh, persistent slash chronic vocal tic disorder, and then when you have both motor tics and phonic tics, 
uh, Tourette syndrome or Tourette's disorder. So even before you kind of think about, you know, medication management or pharmacotherapy or any of this stuff, the first line of, of kind of intervention is really just education. So what goes into kind of psychological education or psychoeducation about Tourette syndrome as well as its co-occurring conditions? This is really about what, you know, causes ticks, what's the underlying factors, and also informing patients and families and, and parents, educators, everybody else, what doesn't go into it? Because I think that's a really, really important piece, making sure that people don't feel to blame. They don't misattribute to one thing as, as causing, you know, ticks. And also understanding the kind of natural course of when things might get a little bit tough, when we need to think about intervening, and, and what's the kind of long-term outcome. Moving on next, the next kind of line of defense or, or next evidence-based treatment is behavior therapy. And behavior therapy is a broad umbrella term uh, that kind of spans, you know, three main evidence-based treatments that have shown up in the literature. The first one being habit reversal training. And, and habit reversal training, the first study I want to say came out in 1973 by, by Nate Azarin, uh, looking at whether or not habit reversal training worked for, for tics, uh, nervous behaviors, habits and a whole uh, host of other conditions. I think it's like 23 some odd kind of conditions he tried to treat with habit reversal training, hair pulling, nail biting, skin picking, and a few others. Um, but what he showed in that in a subsequent weightless controlled trial and then a randomized controlled trial later with Alan Peterson is that you can actually change behaviors, things that we kind of thought to be, you know, neurological in nature, you know, with this behavioral intervention. And this really was the, the kind of foundation on which the comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics was founded. So, so the comprehensive behavioral intervention for tics kind of takes these core components of habit reversal training, you know, psychological education or psychoeducation, awareness training, competing response training, and social support and practice, and pairs it with a function-based assessment and intervention. So looking at you know, what are the things, the situations, the internal and external situations that make tics worse, or better, and how can we modify, you know, the environment to help support the individual during those times? And also, what additional skills can we need? Uh, what additional skills can we use to help kind of um, patients and families during those kind of moments? Uh, over in Europe, there is a slightly different take on behavior therapy, more focused on exposure and response prevention. So exposing young people to premonitory urges and other situations that might make, kind of make ticks a little bit harder and then encouraging them to practice tick suppression abilities to kind of manage the, those types of ticks, similar to the, the kind of treatment that we see for, for OCD. Um, beyond kind of behavior therapy, there's also medication therapy or medication management. Uh, and I'll let Dr. Greenberg kind of go into that, but broadly it kind of falls into three classes or, or groups of medications. Uh, Alpha agonist medications, which are things like guanfacine and clonidine that a lot of people kind of take for, for both ADHD and kind of ticks. Uh, Antipsychotic medications, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, there's only three FDA approved ones, and I'll let Dr. Greenberg talk a little bit more about that. And then there's all other different types of medications kind of in tier two and tier three um, that, you know, that, that are still kind of available and several ones that are still even being kind of tested. And last but not least, there's a combined approach. Uh, and, and the question is kind of when to use that. And, and I'll turn it on over to Dr. Greenberg to talk more about that. Uh, and to echo Dr. McGuire, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for attending our session. Um, so continuing on regarding the treatment guidelines, in 2019, the American Academy of Neurology developed a multidisciplinary panel to review um, or to develop new and updated guidelines regarding the treatment of Tourette syndrome. And their mission was to provide formal guidance on when one should pursue treatment, because um, as they discuss, watch and waiting is an acceptable plan. And if they do decide to pursue, um, how should one choose which treatment and in what order and or combination? Uh, they also went through and noted whether their recommendations were based on um, evidence-based research uh, trial-related conclusions, generally accepted uh, principles of care, uh, evidence from related conditions or, or inferences from other premises. Uh, and then they also characterized the strengths of each of their recommendations. Uh, level A means you must do, level B means you should do, level C meaning you may do. 
And um, I really liked this component of it. They explicitly took into account um, balancing relative benefits and risks, feasibility of complying, cost, and expected variation in patient preferences, um, all of which are things that definitely factor into the clinical uh, component of, of our treatment options. Um, and so, again, they developed a number of recommendations that generally fit into <laughs> the following categories on this, on this slide. Um, uh, the first big category is often around psychoeducation. Uh, and so, very importantly, this includes going over the natural history and typical course of tick disorders, including you know, Tourette's uh, syndrome spectrum disorders. As many of you know, there are up to 90% of individuals with uh, Tourette have a co-occurring condition. So covering the natural history, what, what, mine, what one might expect over the years, age of um, most common um, worst occurring tics, et cetera. And, and again, they explicitly, you know, a must is to explain that watching and waiting is an acceptable treatment approach. Um, how one should consider treatment that said, if there's physical pain, um, functional impairment or psychological distress, and how our treatments um, often, unfortunately, do not result in cessation of ticks. Goal is um, often reduction. They also recommended providing psychoeducation materials and resources to teachers, schools, um, and family members to help them better understand the condition um, and, and the experience of those who are struggling. Another foundation of the guidelines was assessing co-occurring, um, the common co-occurring conditions um, that are often seen in Tourette. And so specifically, OCD and ADHD, which are the most common co-occurring conditions, but also anxiety, mood disorders, disruptive disorders, and, and any concerns regarding safety. Um, a level A recommendation, one must assess suicidality, which is um, also unfortunately likely under um, underreported. Um, then they go into behavioral treatments, and as Dr. McGuire was saying, they recommend CBIT um, relative to the other potential behavioral interventions, HRT, ERP um, support, and before medication, if available. And then regarding medications, they recommend considering alpha agonists, which I'll talk about a little later, particularly when there's co-occurring ADHD, and that's because you see uh, an improved um, treatment effect when it's ticks and co-occurring ADHD when you use alpha agonists versus just ticks alone. Um, and they suggest considering antipsychotics, which is both tiers two and three, if and when the treatment outweighs the risks, and then using the lowest effective dose in order to minimize side effects. And then they also provide guidance on a number of other less sort of common, less well-known treatment options, but that have some evidence uh, or, or limited evidence uh, and that we need more studies for. And this includes um, Botox, topiramate, cannabis, um, deep brain stimulation. And then again, they go into those that, that were either in the middle of research on or need more research on uh, echo PPAM, um, the Chinese tea granule, et cetera. And so, in order to designate certain treatments as evidence-based, that means that they need to be shown to be helpful in, in um, studies that, and Dr. McGuire can go into this since this is a particular expertise, that are randomized and blinded, meaning that the evaluators and the patients don't know what group they're in. Ideally, the results found from these formal clinical trials and studies would reflect what one sees in clinical practice and in real life, However, it's not always the case. Um, and while it is true, much of the time, um, we thought it would be helpful to describe some of the reasons that the ideal or evidence-based is, uh, um, is not always equivalent um, to what one sees practically or what one can do practically. So one large reason um, that this is the case is that clinical trials are rigid and inflexible by design. So in order to eliminate potential confounding or confusing factors that might muddle the results more, um, they're often set up with a number of strict rules, guidelines, and regulations. And these often include um, things like excluding possible potential participants that might be candidates for the treatment in real life, um, but 
but don't pass the the inclusion criteria. Um, and and again, that's to make sure that the results are are clean, not confounded. Um, but when that happens, it, you might not be always capturing the typical population that you're going to be targeting. Um, and in real life, patients and for that matter, treaters are dynamic. So um, you know, people have good days and bad days. Uh, uh, symptoms themselves wax and wane, but when you're in the middle of a study protocol, that that can't um, that shouldn't change more dynamically with how any patient is doing. It's it's really important to follow the guidelines and the scripts as directed by the study. Um, and additionally, there are often or sometimes resources that are available in these clinical trials that might not be accessible or available in typical outpatient or clinical settings. So. That's one of the reasons. Um, another significant problem related to the first bullet point that we were just saying is, is that it is so common that there's co-occurring conditions in those with Tourette's syndrome and that um, sometimes these co-occurring conditions can lead to exclusion from the studies, um, particularly because often the studies are targeting a specific symptom. And so if you're um, targeting uh, ticks, but even though there are increased rates of mood disorders within Tourette population, uh, again, for any particular reason, and, and um, often there are good reasons when doing the study, those with mood disorders might be eliminated. And so again, um, it makes it a little less likely to be able to translate as directly to a typical um, population. Um, and um, additionally, um, the needs of those um, the needs of the patients in the studies often change with time. Um, so actually, for example, I was conducting a study on uh, co-occurring tics and ADHD, um, trying to modify the CBIT approach in order to tailor it more specifically to that population. And one of the uh, young um, uh, uh, you know, tweens I worked with, uh, age 12, um, a, a boy had a relatively sudden debilitating onset of OCD um, that's expected potentially based on his age, based on his history, but given the limitations of the study, we weren't able to target that. Um, and it was something that was significantly leading to increased ticks that in a clinical, in a more clinical setting, we would have been able to um, address more head on. Obviously in any one particular situation, if someone meets uh, if someone is is struggling to the degree that they either need increased levels of care or or other changes, you you the patient comes first. But in general, it's incredibly important to stick to the research regulations in order to um, think of the results as valid. And then um, finally, with kids, we need to keep a really close eye on the developmental trajectory. Um, so particularly in youth, uh, one year makes a big big difference. And, and it can be important to shift the treatment um, and introduce additional interventions if a patient begins falling off the developmental curve. And so, you know, in that case, again, um, it, it could be very helpful to try to target the OCD more quickly if it's leading to them having to leave school secondary to um, struggling with the intrusive thoughts. Um, but in, in certain studies, it's less, um, that's less available. And so in that particular case, um, you know, any any treatment might even be more effective if you're able to uh, co-occurrently address the other conditions. But uh, those are some of the reasons um, that that you might see a difference between what you see in a study versus a clinical population. Awesome, and and I, and I think you you did such a nice do job, Dr. Greenberg, of just kind of highlighting just how different clinical trials, while important and huge. You know, they're really focused on a targeted question. And the way I kind of think about it is, I don't know, dur during this pandemic, I've been watching a lot of the, what is it, the Great British Baking Show. Um, and and you kind of think about it as like the recipe that you want to follow. Uh, but what happens if you don't have all the materials? Like what happens if you don't have everything that you need? How, what can we kind of do to, to adapt to the situation in which we're in? So when you think about the current standard of care, uh, right now, if you're, if, and I'm just going to kind of initially focus on on behavior therapy here for a second, which is the, you know, have a reversal training, comprehensive behavioral intervention for ticks, which is the first one uh, that's recommended by the American Academy of Neurology, and even you know for for any European colleagues that are joining us, uh, exposure with response prevention. So typically, what what kind of goes on? 
is, you know, you sign up in clinical trials, you know, eight sessions of CBIT plus or minus however many is needed, uh, you know, over a period of how many weeks, you know, whatever in, in the initial studies done by John Passantini and Sabina Wilhelm, you're looking at, you know, eight sessions over a period of 10 weeks. You know, and this generalizes into to kind of regular outpatient care where you're coming on in weekly, you know, you're coming on in to see your therapist for, for one hour a week, you know, and you're, you're practicing your CBIT skills and you're getting better and that's fantastic. Um, however, you know, that's not always the case for everybody. You know, while the TAA has centers of excellence around the country, there's large swaths of the United States where there aren't any centers of excellence nearby. You know, there are families that may have to drive three to four hours to get access to somebody who knows how to do CBIT or to a therapist who knows, you know, more about comorbidity or to a child psychiatrist like Dr. Greenberg, who has an expertise in this. So, so how do we kind of, while these randomized controlled trials, while these clinical trials are focused on, you know, once a week outpatient weekly therapy, you know, how do we modify them for those families who are, are far away? who don't have accessibility or, or, you know, really availability of treatment. And this is, a, this is a huge challenge. You know, myself wrote a paper on this in 2016. This is highlighted by, by Larry Scahill in 2013. There's not a whole lot of options, um, you know, for, for patients and families, you know, for therapists. Even if you find somebody and you get nearby, there's long wait lists. It's hard to kind of get in. So how can we increase accessibility and availability of these evidence-based treatments, whether they're medication management or, or behavior therapy like CBIT. So one approach that's been looked at is actually uh, training our, our colleagues, you know, occupational therapists, you know, in doing CBIT. And this work was done by Jan Rowe. Uh, I think down, if I recall correctly, 2013 at the University of Alabama Birmingham Medical Center, uh, one of the Tourette Centers of Excellence uh, led by Leon Durr down there. And what they show is, you know, the occupational therapists are able to, to kind of deliver CBIT with high fidelity, high acceptability by patients, uh, which is fantastic because now it means beyond kind of psychologists and social workers and other mental health providers, there's now a kind of whole other group of folks who can get training and deliver CBIT to help patients and families, which is awesome. Uh, beyond that, we're, uh, Emily Ricketts and a few others have also looked at uh, you know, looking at, you know, can we disseminate CBIT in neurology and developmental pediatric clinics? So if you think about when you first kind of come on into care, uh, typically most patients and families report either being evaluated or diagnosed by a pediatric neurologist, a developmental pediatrician, or, or a child psychiatrist, which, which is fantastic. These people are all wonderful, highly trained, but the American Academy of Neurology and other professional organizations recommend behavior therapy. So there's a little bit of a disconnect, you know, as your first line treatment. Um, so can we kind of teach neurologists, developmental pediatricians to deliver, you know, these kind of core skills within the clinic? So now you have a one-stop shop. Uh, and what they found, again, similar to, to occupational therapy, this is a highly feasible, highly acceptable approach to delivering therapy, which is awesome. So now we have kind of two additional ways to kind of increase access and availability of these evidence-based treatments, which is great. Uh, beyond that, uh, some of our colleagues have started to explore intensive approaches, really asking this kind of basic question, why do we have weekly outpatient therapy? Why do you just kind of come on once a week and, and, and see a therapist and then go back and wait a whole other week later? Can we, just like if you're gonna cram for a test, can we kind of cram all that learning from therapy you know, in, in a week-long period or in a two-week-long period, right? Uh, so there's been, I think, three published studies and maybe one more in the works, uh, done by two done by Tabitha Blunt and Alan Peterson down at the University of San Antonio Health Science Center, uh, and then one done here at Hopkins in 2016 uh, when Matthew Specht was here. And what they looked at is can we, whether it's in a week or a two-week period, you know, take those eight to 10 sessions of behavior therapy and, you know, stack them all back to back to back to back. And this way, a family, if they're living in Iowa, could take two weeks off if that's a feasible thing or, or wherever, you know, they're coming from and learn these skills and then head home. And what's the long-term outcomes from this? And what you see is that this intensive approach works comparably well 
with, with kind of the, the weekly outpatient visits. So I think that there's some, some benefit to it. I think the biggest challenge is, is it's hard to kind of do to take two weeks off and kind of move your life around. Um, so that was, you know, it may not necessarily be the best fit for everybody, but it's something that there's, there's some benefit to. This is great. What about other ways to kind of increase accessibility and availability of behavior therapy and other kind of treatments? Uh, people have explored using group-based therapeutic approaches. Uh, there's been some work done by, um, uh, mainly the group work's been done more in the United Kingdom and in Europe. Uh, and they've kind of done, can we teach, you know, groups eight to 10 year old, uh, eight to, uh, groups of eight to 10 kind of patients, you know, the skills of behavior therapy, like habit reversal training or, or habit reversal training blended with exposure and response prevention. Uh, there's been some work comparing individual versus group-based outcomes. The trials have been relatively small, uh, but they're showing comparable results. Uh, some just challenges that we've seen when we've tried to kind of do our own group work um, is really coordinating people's schedules. You know, getting everybody, you pick Wednesday at five o'clock or, or, you know, what's today, Saturday at 3.30, you know, trying to get everybody together, you know, for once, you know, to do a group session is, is great, but making sure everybody's able to carve out that time gets to be a little bit hard. Uh, the other piece is sometimes some kids when they're, when they're hanging out together, and you'll see this at summer camps, uh, they'll kind of pick up other ticks. So then that kind of poses another challenge of what's kind of, uh, you know, is this a good thing to kind of do in a group-based treatment? So there's some risks and some benefits to that as well, at least that we've seen clinically. Uh, beyond this, and, and you know, the COVID-19 pandemic really kind of has, has expanded the access of telehealth. So uh, one of my colleagues, Matthew Caparati, uh, down at University San Jose, out in California, uh, University of California San Jose, uh, did a study looking at does it matter if you're doing C, but you know face to face, but through this webcam, you know, can we still teach these kind of skills to patients and families? And, and what he found is that it works comparably well to what you would do if you were kind of schlepping on into the office for that hour of, of weekly kind of C, but which again, fantastic, great. So now we're increasing accessibility and availability, you know, across the board. But what happens if, you know, you're a little bit afraid to kind of go see a therapist? You know, there's some kind of stigma uh, around this and you're not ready to kind of accept it or, or kind of use skills. But what happens if you don't get in to, to see a therapist for, for three months? You know, what if the wait lists are that long? Uh, there's been some interesting work, um, you know, looking at Tick Helper. So TickHelper.com uh, is a is a website that actually teaches, you know, it's a, a website that teaches people how to do CBIT, you know, on themselves, teaches the kind of core basic skills, engages you to kind of monitor um, this in, in a way that, you know, you kind of go through the little steps, learning how to build awareness, learning how to implement competing responses and track and kind of monitor your ticks. Uh, some people have really found this to be a fantastic thing, and, and I've also had patients and families who come in and say, it just wasn't for me. I either needed more support or I just didn't like it. Um, but again, it's more about talking about how we're trying to kind of increase the accessibility and availability of these evidence-based interventions. Uh, last but not least, there's some interesting work uh, coming out of my lab looking at, can we augment behavior therapy? with things like cognitive enhancers. So a medication called decycloserine. So, you know, this decycloserine was really popular back in the 2000s as a way to enhance learning going on with exposures. Uh, exposures related to like uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety disorders. And we actually did a, a study on this. Can we pair it with behavior therapy? Not the medication necessarily by itself, but can we pair it with behavior therapy to help patients you know, learn quicker, better, faster. And what we found is that actually when paired with behavior therapy relative to a placebo, actually was able to, to increase the learning and patients were able to, to learn behavioral therapy skills a little bit quicker. So now the next step is to, to kind of go back to what Dr. Greenberg was talking about uh, and see if we can kind of test it in a clinical trial uh, and try to make that clinical trial a little bit more generalizable so that you know we're taking more people from the general community rather than setting kind of, uh, kind of narrow restrictions on it to really help make sure our results are generalizable. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Greenberg here for a minute. 
Yeah, no, thanks, Dr. McGuire. It's, it, I like how you laid each of those out um, and each of them are super important. And, and when you said a three month wait list, I thought, oh, one could be so lucky. <laughs> uh because i i know even in boston with high as high per capita as we have of um, psychologists psychiatrists uh it is six months longer it's hard to find anyone doing it and, and insurance and obviously that varies state to state so more issues but hopefully that telehealth um uh component will start to make things a little bit easier as more people can access different um people that otherwise might have been too far previously um, and so uh, I feel like I often uh, focus and harp on comorbidities, but do so just because they are so um, important in both assessing for and then treating um, and are just so, so common. And so um, related, there's increasing understanding of the potential benefit of targeting multiple conditions simultaneously and not just simply focusing on tics. Uh, so I'll let Dr. McGuire maybe speak a little more uh, about living with ticks as uh, as it was his um, uh, design study. Uh, but the short version is that we also know that quality of life is often impaired in those with Tourette syndrome and that CBIT is tick specific. It doesn't target quality of life, doesn't target ADHD, OCD, anxiety. And so as such, Dr. McGuire and others developed a protocol specifically targeting these quality of life impairments. Um, building from that, myself and, and colleagues recently developed a protocol that was targeting uh, co-occurring tick and ADHD symptoms in youth with a chronic tick disorder, Tourette syndrome. Um, as some studies have shown that having co-occurring ADHD may make one less responsive to CBIT treatment, may show a smaller effect size, and we also know that the combination of ticks and uh, ADHD often leads to increased impairments, um, uh, lowered quality of life, uh, increased difficulty with functioning. And so instead of focusing solely on CBIT and ticks, uh, what we did was we took the, the typical um, 10 session model and then we dedicated three uh, sessions solely to targeting symptoms of ADHD and or executive functioning changed up the sessions a little bit to try to make it more amenable uh, to youth that have uh, perhaps a um, uh, shorter um, degree of tolerating long explanations, uh, you know, gave more movement breaks, gave uh, set up a reward system, which is, in, you know, inherent to all CBIT, but even, you know, within um, the treatment at times. Uh, um, and so anyway, we made a bunch of these little changes with the goal of both targeting, uh, uh, um, amending the CBIT protocol for ADHD and then targeting it specifically. And similarly, we had another one and a half sessions um, uh, that focused on common cognitive behavioral therapy principles like uh, common thinking errors, which again, so many of these kids also have co-occurring anxiety, uh, OCD, though we didn't delve into those specifically, we, we did it more in regard to how one quality of life is impacted by the ticks. Uh, a lot of the kids, and particularly the parents, found that component um, very, very helpful. And um, one of the things that um, we did towards the end, but is the focus of the next study I'll mention, is including a modular approach. So again, a lot of, when we, when we work with um, these youth with Tourette, they might have OCD, ADHD, um, anxiety, mood dysregulation, sensory difficulties, behavioral challenges, disruptive behaviors, um, ASD symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, one idea is to have this modular approach where if a particular symptom doesn't apply, you don't have to do that module, but you can maybe use a module that targets another commonly co-occurring symptom. So in a way you, you end up being able to target more of these with one treatment as opposed to having to go to an ERP therapist for OCD, CBIT for Tourette, parent training for ADHD, et cetera. This particular one, we, we focused on ADHD and tics and, and a little bit of uh, mood dysregulation and other strategies. But I think the more um, you know, future studies doing something like that can be incredibly helpful to, to making things more of these one-stop shops. And um, so um, ESPL, Except, uh, at all who are over at Stanford, they're working on a protocol um, that was incorporating treatments for tics and these commonly co-occurring disruptive behavior disorders. 
uh, and including a modular component um, that would go over parent training, which is a, a, um, a evidence-based treatment for certain disruptive disorders. And so, uh, again, these are underway and, and more studies are needed, but I think uh, it's one approach that can be really, really helpful in the future. Um, and essentially, we're, we're enhancing our current um, effective, helpful behavioral therapies with treatments that address these very relevant co-occurring conditions. All right. And just to, to add one kind of point to, to all of that, you know, and Dr. Greenberg, I think you hit the nail on the head is how frustrating would it be, you know, if you go to your primary care physician, they say, oh, that, you know, I'll, I'll fix this one little thing, but then you got to go to the podiatrist and you go to the podiatrist and they tell you another doctor you need and they kind of get kind of passed around. It would be really nice. And I think that's the kind of point is to of these kind of protocols is to kind of think a little bit more about how can we help the person as a whole? You know, how can we kind of not just treat, you know, one symptom like ticks that people are kind of experiencing, but also how can we kind of help them build resilience, reduce their impairment, enhance quality of life, address inattention and hyperactivity so that people aren't kind of running around. You know, having having a mental health condition is hard enough. Uh, if we can kind of, you know, as providers make things a little bit easier. Uh, that I think can do wonders for patients and families. But moving on to medication therapy, I will turn it on over to you before I put my foot in my mouth. No, that, <laughs> uh, um, I agree with all of that. And um, there is so, so, so much I can say on, on medication therapy and how to try to make it more uh, practical, adjusted to the particular patient. And so I'll go over a number of ideas and concepts, but um, Dr. McGuire and I left a lot of time for Q and A's at the end. So any particular questions, um, feel free to ask there, and then uh, you know we'll try to uh, get to those as well. Uh, and so with medication, there's always the ideal, the expected, the studied, and then there's the what really happens, the feasible, the practical. And um, as Dr. McGuire mentioned, currently the only FDA approved medications in the US for Tourette syndrome are aripiprazole, haloperidol, and uh, pimazide, all potent medications with uh, potentially significant side effects, effective and potentially significant side effects. And what's interesting is when I was in training, which is becoming longer and longer ago, but isn't too long ago, and taking licensing exams, Whenever we were asked for first line treatments um, for Tourette syndrome, the answer was always haloperidol. However, as many of you are well aware, that's certainly not the first line treatment, not even hopefully the fourth line of treatment, um, depending on the individual. And, and so unfortunately that psychoeducation hasn't expanded far enough, fast enough um, for that to be widely um, known and observed. And so not infrequently, I'll meet a patient for the first time who's on Haldol or uh, Haloperidol or Pimazide, and it's the first medication they've been tried on, but they couldn't find a neurologist or a psychiatrist. And so, you know, their PCP thought, okay, th this is what I learned in the boards. This is what I learned you know, in med school and training. Um, so that's definitely an area we need to keep improving the psychoeducation to both um, other specialties and then um, providers in the community. And, um, and so as also previously highlighted, we often follow this three tiered approach and um, where we move from the lowest potential efficacy and side effects to the highest potential efficacy and side effects. I often um, think of it to myself as, as lower risk, lower gain, higher risk, higher gain. And the first um, tier being the alpha agonists, which are somewhat effective some of the time, particularly more so when there's co-occurring ADHD um, and often well tolerated to antipsychotics, um, first atypical antipsychotics, and then uh, which which means that there is a um, uh, it's partially dopaminergic, partially serotonergic modulating, um, which are again often effective, though come with significant possible side effects to typical antipsychotics, which are specific for dopamine uh, modulation, which again um, slightly even more effective 
limited, um, but then also potential significant side effects um, different. The, the atypical category, which I imagine most of you are aware, those are um, the ones like avipiprazole, risperidone, that often have that potential metabolic side effect where you might see weight gain, higher blood pressure, um, increased risk for prediabetes, diabetes that we take very, very, very seriously. And um, when aripiprazole came out and was first studied, um, first so in adults, the weight gain was, was um, more, more neutral or not significant weight gain. And so it was touted as this amazing medication because it didn't have these metabolic side effects. However, unfortunately, in youth, in kids, that's not necessarily the case. And, and recently, a study showed that, that there is uh, not uncommonly significant weight gain in, in aripiprazole, some not, not often as high as risperidone, but um, much higher than initially thought. And so oftentimes, you're really balancing um, what, what you know, you, you never, ever, ever want to make the cure worse than the disease. And, and it's a big battle that we're often going through. And so that's the atypicals, the serotonergic, dopaminergic modulating agents. And then the typicals, um, those are the ones that are um, possibly can be associated with um, you know, blood pressure, um, uh, dizziness, you know, when you stand up getting pretty dizzy, that can happen in the atypicals also, but uh, longer term risk for um, uh, other movement disorder, uh, tardive dyskinesia, low, low risk, but, but significant condition that one does want to follow um, um, closely. So it's, it's again, a, it, you know, strong medications, but really need to be careful and follow for side effects closely. And the big takeaway is that there is a giant jump between tier one and tier two. And, and that's really where we need to find these more effective treatments. And um, as, a as a clinician, that's the area I tend to spend a lot of time in, um, in using those that are off label, but that are you know sort of consensus driven, some of the ones that were discussed in the AAN guidelines, so topiramate for example, is one that I might try to use there. Um, uh, ziprazidone, which is in that atypical antipsychotic category, but potentially a little less potent, less at least of the metabolic side effects. You need to watch for cardiac, you need to follow QTC, but might be a bit well better tolerated. And so it's really, can we find this middle um, better tier two, which leads to, again, uh, this comorbidity, the importance of the comorbidity assessment um, and and really making sure that you know if there is co-occurring OCD, ADHD, anxiety, mood dysregulation, because sometimes that's the missing link in, in seeing whether tics are getting better. Um, oftentimes there's profound anxiety, but um, it might not be obvious, might, isn't always obvious when speaking to the child directly, but that's when it's really important to speak with the parents find out what's going on at school. Here are some examples of, of what their daily routine is like or their weekly routine. And the pandemic, you know, uh, which, you know, it's, it's um, you know, specifically in OCD, we know that um, impairment has increased, symptoms have increased. We're actually looking at whether ticks have increased in a, in a study we're doing over at, at MGH, but it, you know, it's, uh, so some of these extra factors are out of one's control, but some are more within one's control. And so, um, you know, SS, I commonly use an SSRI. Um, so if someone I'm treating for tics, but then also has anxiety, OCD, depression, I will often use an SSRI, obviously behavioral therapy first, always behavioral therapy first, but, but either in conjunction or if it's not enough, adding in an SSRI. And, and one thing that I often find tricky, but is a very common real life scenario is because we know there are so many comorbidities, it's really hard to continue to keep having conversations about adding medications, um, particularly in youth. And it's really something that I struggle with, the kids struggle with, the parents struggle with. Um, but I, I like to try to use an analogy of, you know, if someone has a, a heart condition, they might have high blood pressure, they might have high cholesterol, they might have difficulties with their rhythm. They use different medicines for each one. 
but it's still all the heart. It's still one broad condition driving a lot of it. And so I, that's often where I try to explain why we might, why we do need to still treat these comorbidities. It is another medication. And unfortunately, our medications are just not at the place where one can often target more than one symptom or if it can, so if you get to the atypicals, you might get extra benefit in um, mood regulation, et cetera. But then those that often treat more conditions are often more potent. And so now you're looking for more, watching for more side effects. So really it's just a lot of balancing, weighing risks, benefits, side effects for, for every particular kid. I am hoping as, and we know that there are treatments in the pipeline, uh, such as echo PPAM, which, which hopefully we'll start to have more of the results on um, soon, um, because again, it's, we really just need a better between tier one and tier two um, approach. And so then finally, in terms of just, again, practical approaches, it's, it's just so important um, to be weighing, it's the individualized risks benefits for each treatment and and so if you have a if you work with a child that's an elite athlete or an elite musician and clonidine might cause sedation you might be a lot less likely to use that than a medicine that perhaps might be a little less effective but isn't going to lead to that same tiredness so it's really really important to just for any particular child and medication weighing the risks and benefits and um, what I also often like to say, it's, it's not just the risk of treating, it's the risk of not treating. And so given what we know in terms of potential impairment on self-esteem, quality of life, et cetera, if, if that is driven by ticks, you know, I'll, I'll often pose that question, you know, here, here is what we would wanna watch for, here's what we're hoping to see. Uh, yes, it is starting a medicine, but what, do we think if we don't start the medicine, you know, again, that's that developmental trajectory. And if someone is really, really struggling, leaving school daily, others, you know, ideally systems are in place. Ideally, the school's on board and helpful. It's just, again, that's ideal. It's not always practical. And so um, it's, it's looking at what is the scenario right now? What do we need to do to get the child in a better place? And again, CBIT, number one, as effective as, atypical antipsychotics, but not always accessible, feasible, hopefully with what Dr. McGuire was saying, you know, more so. Um, but again, these are the things that we're um, thinking. And then I mentioned, you know, getting getting creative safely. And, and that's, are, are there, um, you, even though the evidence is, is limited and it's, you know, uh, important to um, uh, um, take that significantly into account. Sometimes if a child has tics, OCD, um, and needs a little bit of a push, but doesn't want to, and I don't want to increase the medicine, change the medicine, I might recommend an acetylcysteine. Um, you know, results were mixed. Dr. Block did a study pretty recently that was very, very small, but maybe showed a signal in augmentation with uh, NAC on um, OCD. So it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, or, you know, sometimes um, we'll, we'll do half doses of medication. It, it's whatever we need to do to try to help the child and minimize side effects. Um, and then, you know, even with all that, even in an ideal world, if the medicine did what it's supposed to do at the right time for the right kid, there's also these practical considerations, uh, often cost. So uh, um, lorazidone, um, its brand name is Latuda, is, is a treatment I will sometimes want to try because it also, uh, that one is weight neutral in kids. It's more dopaminergic. And so hypothetically, I would love to use that before aripiprazole, risperidone, et cetera, but it is so hard to get it improved by insurance that for some people it, it's, it's, they physically cannot obtain it. And so that's where, you know, these external elements are, are limiting us. Um, or like practically, uh, practically in a, in a family with like parents with multiple jobs or single parent or multiple kids, ha having a child take a medicine three times a day just might not be practical. Um, and, and so, you know, it's, it's really, it's not just important, like whether, you know, you weigh the risks and benefits, but, but is the child going to actually be able to take the medicine you're prescribing in the way you're prescribing? Because if not, 
then it's not helpful. Uh, and so those are a lot of the different um, ways that, you know, we have our theoretical guidelines that I discussed in the beginning, and then just truly, truly individualized management, particularly for Tourette syndrome. And we'll go from there. So, so first of all, Dr. Greenberg, that was, I feel like, I got a little primer on pharmacotherapy and I think that was so comprehensive and really, I mean, for me, one of the things that I took away was I, I didn't even think about timing of doses or, or kind of like breaking that apart a little bit. That's something that I was uh, came up even earlier today when I was talking to a family. So, so I think these things are all so relevant and it kind of hits home of, you know, back to those clinical trials, you know, sometimes they're dosed once a day. Uh, but, you know, meeting the family where they're at, you know, assessing for their needs and figuring out, you know, how, you know, we can kind of best help them. Uh, so, so, you know, one of the things that we wanted to kind of do was have a, a leave a fair amount of time for kind of questions and answers. Uh, and, and, you know, hopefully we have the answers, but at least, you know, kind of talking through some of these questions and if we can kind of provide some insight. Uh, I know our delightful moderator um, has been monitoring the questions, so I will give her yes, a chance. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Greenberg and Dr. McGuire, for such an excellent presentation. We are now going to begin answering the questions submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions panel if you're in the control panel. If we are unable to get to all the questions submitted, we will be following up after the session with a response. Additionally, here at the Tarot Association, we have a full-time information and referral staff available to assist you by emailing support at Tourette.org or calling 1-888-4-Tourette. Okay, so we have several questions. Um, this question is from Judith. Many of us are providing CBIT virtually and able to treat people from out of the area. I see strong results from virtually delivered treatment. What are you seeing? Uh, so I'm happy to take that one, Dr. Greenberg. So Judith, I, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for providing care. I mean, I think there's it, there's so long wait lists and, and patients and families need that help. So, so thank you, A. Um, I think it depends. So I've had some patients and families who've done so well with, with telecebit. And, and I want to kind of differentiate, I guess, a little bit telecebit from, from kind of teletherapy broadly, because there's other challenges broadly with teletherapy. But I think patients and families, when somebody's motivated to learn the skills and use them, you know, patients and families succeed. And, and that's the exact same thing. So I, I hope telehealth is here to stay. I think with the pandemic and a lot of other stuff, some patients and families have struggled a lot. You know, now moms and dads are not only providing support for, for kind of kids and CBIT, but they're also being an educator. Uh, they're also kind of working from home. They're also being mom and dad at home with you know two or three kids. So I think it also stresses the family system. Uh, similarly, a lot of kids are stressed from virtual school. So I, I think you know for some kids this is this is a huge boon. This is a great thing. Um, but for other kids, I think there's also a lot of stress going on in the family that makes things a little bit worse. I don't, Dr. Greenberg, did you have anything to kind of add? No, uh, that's uh, I, I agree. I, I don't currently do CBIT treatments, but um, I yet yet we'll stand <laughs> did, did hopefully I, I, you know, but but the goal is to expand and and incorporate it more again the one stop um, shop. But for those kids that I do have in CBIT, they they seem to be doing well, fine, you know, no different than than typical, and and maybe even. Um, maybe even a little better because there's uh, I have had a few kids that previously were would get so wound up in transit going to and from CBIT and once that was taken away um, that helped but again that's anecdotal. Thank you we have another question about CBIT from Chris he says can CBIT be effective if the child does not have a precursor or feeling before a tick? Yes uh, short answer, so yes, uh, short answer, Chris. Long answer, um, so one, you know, a lot of young kids won't have uh, premonitory urges or, or precursors or as one six-year-old that I saw said, every time he had an itchy, he did a fluffy. Um, so every time he had an itch in his throat, he did his throat clearing tick like a <clears throat> um, So, you know, you, you can, uh, one, 
by the by kind of practicing awareness training um, some people can kind of detect that other people even if it's not a premonitory urge there's sometimes pre-tick movements that'll kind of happen so for example before i do like a, a head turn like this if i kind of notice that i always do it when i sit up straight or if i do it in a certain chair um you know you can kind of look for those pre-tick movements the other piece is that kind of functional assessment are those ticks happening you know in certain rooms and certain times of the day during certain activities and that can kind of be used as your your ability to help detect or help kind of you know be on guard to implement competing responses i think the biggest thing uh and, and joey esso who's a postdoc in the lab just put out a paper on this talking about you know, using the skill of your homework adherence. So what she kind of found when analyzing these clinical trials of CBIT was that the more you use the competing responses, the more you use the CBIT skills, you know, outside of the office, the better you get. So, so I think it's less about, you know, do you start treatment with an urge or, or, or not, or, you know, awareness or, or an itchy, if you will, but really are you using the skills? Um, and I think that's a really important part, but great question. Thank you. Another question that we have, in your experience, what tends to be an effective dose for a Ariprazole for, for severe tick and diagnosed Tourette syndrome? Yeah, um, I believe the, um, I could find the chart, but often um, when I'm using Ariprazole in Tourette, five to 10 uh, is often for the more severe um, in general. Uh, obviously always weighing you know the the side effects i've anecdotally but i've sometimes found getting too far above that maybe 15 max but again i i treat um 18 and under uh is that the side effects start to outweigh any of the benefit and so then even if you might get more benefit you're you're losing out because of sedation because of xyz um but while we keep going i can um also find a little chart that I believe Dr. Coffey uh, developed at, at some point that, that goes into the optimal doses, which I, and or I could share that with the TAA afterwards to be able to send to the people in the, uh, in the audience. Thank you. I, I have a, a question from Melissa. There's several parts to it, so I'm, I'm just going to read. Um, is ABA an effective intervention for kids with Tourette's? How do CBIT and CBT HRT differ from ABA? And then which specialists, BCBA or clinical psychologist, should be the point person for the development and supervision of intervention at school for a TS ADHD student? I'll let Dr. McGuire take that. <laughs> so 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 clearly the person asking this question is really savvy. Um, and knows a whole lot uh, about kind of ticks and ADHD. So, so who should kind of provide CBIT? Somebody who's trained, somebody who's experienced. Uh, you know, so there's a, a social worker, um, you know, in our program, Nicole Dover, you know, who's fantastic. And, and, you know, she came into this, you know, with a social work degree, you know, does that mean, you know, she's less or, or more than, than an ABA, than a PsyD, than a this and a that? It, it's whoever's kind of trained and whoever's kind of good. So, so I want to kind of set that aside. Um, who, because it, it's less about the degree and more about your experience and your training. Uh, my my opinion. Uh, I'm sure somebody may have a different one, but but that's kind of my experience. Uh, second piece to this is, um, you know, difference between HRT in, in CBIT and CBT. Uh, so mental health professionals love acronyms. So we come up with great acronyms. You come up with a good acronym, then you got to try to figure out how to fit something in there. Um, so HRT is just that habit reversal training. That's the kind of core piece of, of you know, psychoeducation, awareness training, identifying those kind of pre-tick movements that, that somebody asked a question about earlier, or pre-tick awareness, and implementing those competing responses and social skills training. What CBIT did is it kind of built on that really great foundation and said, well, that's awesome. But going back to that question, what if you don't have an urge? Well, what if, you know, you notice that ticks get worse in certain activities? What happens, you know, if you notice they're, they're better or worse during certain times of the day? So building those kind of interventions around it so that it also incorporates that function-based assessment and intervention. Uh, CBT or exposure-based CBT is what we kind of use 
for OCD and anxiety. And Dr. Greenberg kind of hit the nail on the head earlier when she was talking about SSRIs, the first ERP. Uh, you know, ERP is just the exposure with response prevention, which is really kind of facing the kind of fear associated with OCD and not give, uh, not engaging in the kind of ritual or avoidance uh, to kind of help all of that happen. Um, so, so that that kind of answers that. And the third part, who's best to kind of manage care? I think somebody who knows, you know, your your son or your daughter well, you know, somebody who's gone into the classroom. Who, who kind of understands, you know, it's not just the symptoms of whatever's kind of going on, it's how they're interfering with learning. How are they getting in the way? Um, so, you know, there's somebody who, you know, may have a pretty mild eye tick, for example, you know, they may kind of roll their eyes, but if they're doing that all the time, particularly when they're trying to do a time test, you know, an appropriate intervention may be to kind of say, hey, they need a little bit of extra time. And over time, you know, you'd want to learn the CBIT skills to implement so that that wouldn't be an issue, so that it would empower them so that they wouldn't need accommodations. But in the short term, as they're learning those skills, as we're uptight trading medication, if that's the right language, and I'll defer to Dr. Greenberg on that for, for nonverbal head nods, um, then, then empowering them to, to kind of, you know, get through those tough moments and then get peel back those accommodations over time. But it, it's really somebody who knows, you know, your son or your daughter best and meeting them where they're at. Dr. Greenberg, anything else to add? No. Uh, super comprehensive and, and completely agree and would defer to you on a question such as that. <laughs> We've known each other too long. <laughs> Great. So we have another question from Elia. There appears to be a significant increase in adolescent girls presenting with psychogenetic tics in the context of the pandemic, perhaps thanks to social media. Someone yesterday suggested that one could use CBIT for such presentations, but this would seem counter to usual treatment for functional disorders. Can you please share some thoughts on this? Dr. Greenberg, did you <laughs> Just to say that's a fantastic question, and, and uh, whoever asked that, I completely um, uh, agree like we are we are in that right now and i had a 12 year old patient the other day say yeah a lot of my friends have the anxietics and i was like what's that and and it sounds like this this phenomenon which was more just new to me over the last couple of weeks is pretty um pretty like front and center um right now um there's a great paper from a little while ago a few years ago Leave by Robinson and I uh, Headley, maybe I forget the other author's last name, about tick attacks. And, and essentially, um, uh, Dr. Scharf and I, uh, Jeremiah Scharf, who work together at Mass General, we often will call them add-on ticks. So, you know, there's there's the teretic ticks that that are um, to the degree we are aware consistent with the neurophysiology of, of what causes them, and then you might see these add-on ticks, tick attacks, which are really more um, either, from what we understand, anxiety-driven and or more psychogenic, um, lots of different words, functional, et cetera, et cetera. Point is the person is experiencing them as real. So it's it's not, um, you know, I think people sometimes will mix up psychogenic with faking or malingering. And just to make sure that it's to say that that is not the case, the, the person undergoing these is experiencing movements that feel out of their control. The difference is it's not necessarily driven by Tourette. It might be more driven by anxiety or, or conversion, which is literally neurologic presentation of psychiatric underpinning syndrome. So anxiety leading to a functional tick. And so, yeah, I, I would, um, to be honest, I don't, I don't even, I'd have to think through more about CBIT, but I would say um, would be first therapy and, and trying to understand um, what's behind it in terms of anxiety, in terms of other, you know, the the, the environment. I think uh, what one thing the pandemic has has done is just increase baseline stress of everyone across the board, making everyone more vulnerable at risk to anxiety, depression, et cetera, et cetera. And as one of my patients said recently, Everyone's pretending to be normal in a world that's not normal. And, and so I, I do, you know, I'm hypothesizing, but I do wonder if some of this expression, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of stress right now. Um, and, and so I 
you know, I think it's important to not identify them as Tourette's tics, but to identify them as something that we need to help uh, these kids with. So, so I'm going to add on a little bit and take a slightly different approach, um, related, but slightly different. So we've seen kind of during the pandemic, kind of three types of folks coming on in, you know, patients who are first diagnosed with tics, like pretty typical patients who had tics, you know, when they were younger, but stress has gotten bad, whether it's due to virtual schooling or, or kind of being at home, you know, with your sibling, you know, all day long, yeah, it can be a little tough or, or whomever. Um, you know, there's a lot of stress going on in the world. Uh, and then, you know, what, what you really kind of hit, hit the nail on the head with that question is there is this, this kind of group of folks who are coming into the clinic um, and experiencing a sudden onset of ticks. And, and, you know, pretty, it doesn't kind of fit the natural kind of course of what you'd expect. Uh, usually kind of see ticks onset four to eight years of age, kind of peak in severity in adolescence. This is kind of coming on in an adolescence and bam, really, really big, really, really powerful kind of ticks. Uh, and this is being seen in, in many kind of tick specialty centers. Uh, uh, going back to, I think it was uh, Hetterly uh, has a paper yes. that just came out in, in the British Journal of Clinical Psychology. Uh, not not the tick attack one that you referenced uh, with Sally Robinson, but but a different one. This one just came out. Uh, Tamara Pringsheim, who uh, was the lead author on the American Academy of Neurology Guidelines, is putting something out. You know, we've sent something in. This is a phenomenon that a lot of people are seeing. And in the the the, the clinical presentation is a little bit different. So ticks typically with typical Tourette syndrome and tick disorders, you see. ADHD and OCD is common comorbidities and, and kind of ticks start early on and predominantly affects boys. Uh, and these kind of young women who are coming on in, it's, it's mainly affecting women. That's not exclusively, but, but primarily onsetting an adolescence and presenting alongside anxiety and depression. Um, so, so does CBIT kind of work for that? Does CBIT itself as the, the kind of standard uh, intervention, you know, will those kind of treat the movements and, and all the anxiety, all the depression and everything else kind of going on? Um, no, like the CBIT can kind of be very useful for the ticks. The principles of CBIT can be very useful for, for other aspects of behaviors. You know, when you look at the underlying mechanisms and the underlying skills taught, you know, in behavior therapy, in CBIT, in CBT, there's a lot of similarity. So you can kind of, uh, a very savvy clinician can kind of take, you know, those same principles and adapt them to help the patient in front of them. And I think that's what probably the other person was talking to. I think in general, social media, uh, you know, can be, can be a, a source for good and a source for, for kind of um, less good. I'll say, I'll say it that way. Um, but I think that's where some of this stuff has kind of come from. But, but fantastic question. And I would say that there should be more kind of papers coming out talking about that soon. Thank you. Carrie asks, can you please elaborate on the use of cannabis in treating ticks? That's a Dr. Greenberg question. <laughs> yeah, and that's one that um, I am asked very, 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 very frequently, and that I think is a very reasonable question um, because there are a handful of studies in adults um, from Germany back in, I think, either 2000, 2010, um, mueller Valls group that studied mm -hmm. cannabis in adults with Tourette and in, in small studies did show a positive signal in it helping the ticks. And, and what was interesting, and again, this is one, one or two small studies, we need a lot more studies um, on cannabis, was that ca uh, cannabidiol, CBD alone, was not effective in benefiting ticks, but when there was a component of THC, that was when you saw um, a, a change. And the, you know, so that's sort of part one. Part two is then also thinking about the potential side effects. So just like what we were saying in terms of low risk, low gain up to high risk, high gain, my personal opinion is that sometimes cannabis is underestimated in terms of the potential risks um, and especially in young adult, uh, not, sorry, especially in children, teens. Um, so often it's, it's recommended that one not really smoke until at least age 25 
or after. That's not the prime age that one often um, hears about it, but the earlier one starts, the more potential long-term negative consequences there are, either in terms of executive functioning, um, increased risk for psychotic disorders, et cetera, et cetera. And so it, it really is one that I do think needs to be studied more. And so there's a Cochrane review that basically says we need more and actually the AAN guidelines um, what it describes is dronabinol, dr which is THC component, is possibly more likely than placebo uh, to reduce ticks. Best for patients with, um, uh, sorry, uh, the, the, to reduce ticks in adults, insufficient evidence to determine whether other strains um, or CBD is similar, should be avoided in children and adolescents because of the paucity of evidence uh, and the association between cannabis and potentially harmful cognitive effective outcomes um, in adulthood. And so it, that, you know, but again, that said, if, if, if someone who is 18, 17 has tried five to 10 different atypicals, antipsychotics with significant effects, weight gain, dulling, et cetera, et cetera, I, th I think we need to be careful about categorically closing it down because I, I you know, I think there it's just very, very important to be observing risks and benefits for any particular medication. But of, um, you know, right now there there really is that potential signal coming from those um, previous studies. And mechanistically, Dr. Coffey will sometimes speak about how um it uh the the endocannabinoid system is is implicated or can be implicated in, in Tourette to a degree so there's a physiological reason it might even make sense but um so basically um we do we don't recommend it currently specifically not to kids and adolescents but more work needs to be done about how to use it if so and how to use it safely i don't know if dr mcguire has additional no, that that you 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 hit the nail on the head. I think some people benefit from it and some people don't. Um, yeah. And we need more research. We genuinely need more research to figure out for whom and when and what doses and what's going on. So, so hopefully in the Great next question. five years, we'll see. Exactly. Any other? I know we're almost out of time. Any last question or last two questions? Yes. Uh, we won't be able to get to everyone's question, but the last question I'll ask right now is. From Deborah, do patients eventually develop tolerance to sedation from clonidine? My child has OCD, ADHD, Tourette stimulants, worsen ticks, and OCD. Is that common? Stayed on clonidine for years with a little benefit, and um, they're also on SSRIs and risperidone. Yeah, um, and so with the um, important caveat that just because I don't know um, the child, any any ideas, recommendations, thoughts are are very general, and and I don't want to um, specifically make any recommendations without knowing the patient and and their history. But to answer the initial question about maybe it's two parts dependence. Um, uh, basically, do you have to increase the dose of clonidine over time? Might be part of it, and the other, do you um, get used to side effects seen, given it can be sedating? And so, regarding side effects, yes, um, and oftentimes, pretty consistently, after two, two to three weeks, um, it, if one is particularly tired, sedated with clonidine, you see that waning. Um, if someone after two to three weeks is still really tired, sedated that's depending on that particular individual that's when i might start to think okay maybe this dose might not be the right dose this medication might not be the right right medication regarding whether you need escalated doses as one gets older super super tricky and no clear cut answer i think that's based you know to a degree the amount of clonidine that you can give is based on weight but it's not one to one and that the bigger you are the more you need, I think it's more dependent on one's brain changing over those years and, and ticks often being the worst in that 10 to 14 age, which is also when you're growing. And, and so it's not uncommon that, you know, if I'm working with someone who's eight or nine and they're taking 0 0.05, 0 0.1 at night, then they're 12, 13, yeah, might go to 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I usually max out around 0.4, though very carefully following blood pressure, you could probably go uh, you can potentially go a little higher, but but it it I've seen it 
be helpful. The other thing I like to do with clonidine is if it is sedating, I try to see if I can switch it over to um, extended release clonidine, uh, brand name Capve. I personally, anecdotally, have not had as good luck with extended release guanfacine in Tunib. And then there was recently a study a couple of years ago that showed that the extended release guanfacine uh, in Tunib did not beat placebo in ticks. So I do tend to stay more if I'm really targeting harder ticks in the in the clonidine group. Um, but but and again, that profile you mentioned is super, super common and hard. And and often I will be trying to use uh, a clon alpha agonist. SSRI, if needed, atypical antipsychotic, and, and sometimes even stimulant, just to put it out there, um, even though I think it's been known now for a while, if you have ADHD and tics, it is okay to use a stimulant. And actually, if you use alpha agonist and stimulant, it's shown to be synergistically beneficial in helping both ADHD and tics. That doesn't mean for any one kid, tics could increase. It's not never, but on the whole, it's shown to be um, potentially very effective and helpful, and some kids even say beneficial to their ticks. Thank you so much again to Dr. McGuire and Dr. Greenberg for such a wonderful presentation. This is all the time that we have for this session. Once the session is closed, you will receive a survey on the presentation. We would greatly appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of the webinar. Additionally, the webinar will be posted on the Tourette Association YouTube channel for those who are unable to participate today. We encourage you to reach out to us about this webinar for other resources and opportunities to connect. On behalf of the Tourette Association, thank you again for joining us and taking the time to view our presentation. This presentation was presented free of charge thanks to our generous donors. If you appreciated this session, we welcome you to support the organization. Visit us at Tourette.org to learn more and to give. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.